Greetings members and welcome to the July lecture for the Royal Geographical Society of South Australia and while we're not meeting in the same room at the moment we certainly hope that um, recording this July lecture will be the next best thing because I'm here to tell you that the subject matter today is going to be absolutely fascinating. I'm sure you'll be enthralled to hear the story that you're about to hear. What we're hoping from a society perspective is that uh, the good news with the COVID-19 crisis continues and that we'll start to get back to some sort of normal operation before too much longer. In fact, there's some hope that we might be able to hold our August lecture uh, as a live event at Walkerville. So let's keep our fingers crossed. But now to today's lecture. And the Australian dog fence is a little bit like the Great Wall of China. It stretches from one side of the country to the other, from Queensland to Western Australia, and it's designed to keep out the raiding hordes from the north. In the case of the dog fence, the structure was built to protect, protect the livestock of southern Australia from predation by dingoes and wild dogs. Recently, government and industry have combined to spend many millions of dollars to actually rebuild the fence. In this lecture, we'll hear from someone who served on the SA Dog Fence Board for 12 years and for four of those as chair of the board. That's Dr Carolyn Island, a retired consultant botanist and rain climatologist who's involved in land use studies, vegetation surveys and other natural resource management matters. She's also been a sessional commissioner for the Environment, Resources and Development Court and a director of the Australian Rangeland Society. She was a member of the South Australian Pastoral Board for 10 years and the South Australian Arid Lands Natural Resource Management Board for six years. And from her doctoral research, she knows more than just a little about the sustainable management of the Western Mile woodlands in South Australia under pastoral land use. So it's now a very warm welcome, a very warm RGS welcome to Dr. Carolyn Island. Welcome, Thank Carolyn. Thank you very much, Linda. It's really lovely to be here. Well, good morning everybody, and after that wonderful introduction from Lee, um, I'm very, very happy to be here to talk to you about something that's been my passion for very many years. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, what I'm going to talk about this uh, today. Um, the first thing I want to talk a bit about is the history of the dog fence. Um, I'll go on to talk about the purpose the dog fence, a little bit about the State Dog Fence Board for, um, and its role. I was a member there for 12 years and chair for four. And also a little bit about the local dog fence boards who actually do most of the work. Um, I'll talk a bit about how we've raised money in the past, quite a difficult task and very small budgets. Um, I'll talk a bit about the pressures on the fence from the north. And I'll also talk a little bit at length, well, quite a bit actually, about the funding we actually managed to get from the federal, state and state governments and from the livestock industry to uh, make it a much better fence. The dog fence has its origins way back in, um, in early pastoralism in South Australia. And it's an extraordinary feat of human endeavour. During the late 1800s, following the introduction of rabbits, dingo numbers increased to such a level that some pastoralists in South Australia started to build dog-proof and rabbit-proof fences around their properties. Neighbouring properties also gathered together to build what we call cluster fences nowadays, or clusters of pastoral properties who had a boundary fence around the whole properties. The government uh, noticed this, of course, and passed the first Vermin District Act in 1894, so it was a very long time ago that this all started to happen. The Vermin Districts were formalised with this Act in 1894, and by 1931 there were 64 Vermin Districts in South Australia and an estimated 55,000 kilometres of fences. This map um, that you'll see on the, uh, on above me here, the big map is a, a, um, a very old map, actually used to hang in the dog fence board office. I'm pretty sure it might still be there. 
of all the old vermin districts in the Northwest Pastoral District. And you can see there are many, many districts. The smaller map on the side shows the vermin districts that went out along the Great Australian Pike, uh, which are not included in the dog fence today. You'll see the solid boundary to the right hand side of that little map is where the dog fence ends these days. I just thought you'd be interested in seeing some of the pictures of uh, building a dog fence back in the old days. They used to use camel trains. Men would go out there, and the women in those days, to um, build fences and be away from home for a very, very long time. The Act um, ran from 1894 until 1946, and it allowed the proclamation of these vermin districts the appointment of a board to manage them, the right of the board to actually um, get money or borrow money to construct some of the fences, and also it provided for the board to set a rate for to collect a contribution from the pastoralists that they were protecting. By the end of World War II, it became clear that the expense of maintaining all of these 55,000 kilometres fence was going to be much too impractical and much too costly. The government and the board, the Vermin District Board at that point in time, but eventually it became the Dog Fence Act and the Dog Fence Board, um, decided to join up all the fences along the top of the sheep pastoral areas and concentrate on one long fence all the way from the Great Australian uh, Bight eventually it ended up in Dolby in Queensland, but for South Australian purposes it ended at the New South Wales border. The early years were very, very difficult, but eventually all the gaps were filled in and uh, we had a fence which stretched for 2,150 kilometres across South Australia. As I said, um, the dog fence starts at the cliffs of the Great Australian Boat and you'll see a picture on the, on the left hand side there where the fence actually falls over the edge of the cliff and, the, and stops the dogs walking around the edge of it. Um, it ends at the New South Wales border and the other picture shows um, a picture of the New South Wales fence going up um, from north to south towards Cameron's Corner. The total length of the fence in South Australia, New South Wales and Queensland is 5,400 kilometres and it ends northeast of Dolby in the Great Dividing Range of Queensland. I've not travelled along it that far, I've been as far as, um, as uh, the end of the New South Wales fence near Huendon, Huendon? No, no, it's not Huendon, it's Hungerford, that's right, Hungerford. Mm -hmm. And I've also crossed it several times going up and down during, through Queensland when I've been working and also on holiday out to Cape York, so uh, I have seen a fair amount of it. I've also travelled along the whole of the South Australian dog fence six times the whole length, so uh, I'll tell you a bit about that later. So, why do we need a fence? Well, it may not be obvious to many people who live in cities, but it is to keep the dingoes and the dog wild dogs out. And I will refer to them mostly as wild dogs because uh, from our point of view, they are wild dogs. They really aren't a native species. They've only been here for a few thousand years and um, they do destroy sheep. There is no way that they're compatible with sheep. So that's the reason we need a fence. Um, the fence separates uh, the cattle country to the north and the sheep country to the south in the pastoral regions of Australia. The dog fence is there to protect South Australia's valuable $4.3 billion livestock industry and that's $4.3 billion a year. As I said before, it's a well-known fact that dogs and sheep are totally incompatible. Dogs will kill lots of sheep overnight and leave them to die, they won't eat anything. And there's a couple of pictures which show some of the damage. I have some worse ones and I haven't put them on, on the screen and I have set some people. I'd like now to 
to talk a little bit about the legal status of the dingo or wild dog. The wild dog or dingo is a declared animal pest in the south of the dog fence in South Australia under the South Australian National Parks and Wildlife Act. And it's an unprotected species north of the fence under the Natural Resource Management Act, which is not a very well known fact. In fact, the status of the dingo all over Australia in different states is different in every state. And the only uh, federal um, note on this is that under the EPBC Act or the Environment, uh, Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, it's a protected species but only in national parks and reserves that are managed by the federal government. So the dingo has, or the wild dog, has uh, very many jurisdictions it has to live under. And uh, there's lots of um, there's lots of toing and froing between states and between organisations to try and figure out what it is. But in South Australia, it's a pest south of the fence, and it's unprotected north of the fence. Genetic studies suggest that the dingo was introduced uh, from East or Southeast Asia and came down through the Malay archipelago into South into Australia, sorry, into Australia. Um, and some of the earliest skeletal remains that we found um, suggest that the dingo arrived here three to three and a half thousand years ago. Um, there are some DNA um, studies that have been done which suggest that it might be as much as 8,000 years ago, but they're still very much in their infancy, those studies. Certainly the dog was here when early settlers arrived. Um, the picture at the top of the screen is a painting um, of the large dog sighted by Captain James Cook in 1768, and it was later um, classified um, by people in England as Canis familiaris dingo, which is what it's remained ever since. The Governor Arthur Phillip, the bottom picture, also made a brief, brief description and an illustration in his journal of the dog of New South Wales in, 18, in 1793. So the dog was there then, and we do know from skeletal remains it was earlier than that. Now I'd like to move on to the Dog Fence Board. Under the Dog Fence Act of 1946, the board consists of five members. They're appointed by the Minister for Primary Industries and Regional Development. That's currently Tim Whetstone. It used to be um, come under the auspices of the Department of Environment. In fact, for many years we had Department of Environment was the actual, and the board were run by that. And then it was uh, the administration and the staff came under the Department of Primary Industries and that was always really difficult to work with and luckily under the new government in South Australia we have come now under the, uh, under the primary industries altogether and it's a much easier uh, system to work under. The board members comprise of one nominee of the Minister Tim Whetstone um, uh, two nominees from Livestock SA, one nominee of the Minister responsible for the NRM Act, and one nominee of the Far West Dog Fence Board Association. Um, the board thus consists mainly of pastoralists. In fact, at the time that I was on the board, I was the only one who wasn't a, an actual working pastoralist for the whole 12 years I was on the board. I do have a come from a farming background, from a dairy farming background, so um, I do understand what happens and what makes things tick in the pastoral lands. Um, there are two and a half full-time employees of the uh, dog fence, a manager, an inspector of fences and a part-time administrative assistant. The local dog fence boards. Now, the ownership of the fence is something that confuses people a lot. Um, 
for a long, long time, the fence was actually owned by the individual pastoralists, and it was their responsibility to actually maintain the fences on behalf of everyone who lived south of the fence. And some time back, it was decided that this really wasn't a very fair arrangement, and um, it, I think it was in the 90s that um, a new system was, was actually thought up, that we would ha have local dog fence boards um, which would actually receive money from the government or from the dog fence board um, to hire patrolmen and to make repairs to the fence on behalf of everybody south of the fence. And these would be made up, these local boards, of local pastoralists who lived south of the fence. That has been a much better system. There has also been a system in place where if the individual pastoralists wanted to hang on to the their piece of fence, that was easy to organise as well, as long as they agreed to maintain the fence and patrol it regularly. We had for a while two lots of um, private owners, one um, over in the northeast, and that's since stopped. But the large block of land owned by the Jumbo Pastoral Company in the northwest, Commonwealth Hill, Mobella, and Norgathing stations, are still run by Jumbo Pastoral Company. And they do an absolutely superb job of looking after the fence and Mark Hand patrolling it, as you would if you've got sheep living on the southern side of the fence. Um, so there are two different ways of, of, of having ownership of the fence. There's the local dog fence boards, which do it on behalf of the local pastoralists, and there's one private owner left. Um, the local dog fence boards um, contract out the work of the fence maintenance to patrolmen, who are supposed to, and they do, I've seen them do it, uh, patrol the fence every fortnight for about between three and four hundred kilometres of fence per patrolman. These are contract workers who don't live on the fence and they uh, come from usually from towns like Cooper Pedy or um, out on the west coast from St. Um, and they look after the fence. We, we as the dog fence board would then allocate money to each board and also to the private owner for capital works and maintenance. The employment, supervision and management of each board's patrolman is the responsibility of the local dog fence boards. The oversight and of the fence and ensuring it is dog proof is the responsibility of the board, that's the main dog fence board. The manager and the inspector of fences. Now the inspector of fences must control the fence three times each year in its entirety and his responsibility is to audit the work of the local boards and the patrolmen and to provide advice where needed and keep, to keep the dog fence proof. It's dog proof. It's also his responsibility to make sure there's enough material to, for the fence to be fixed, to arrange its storage and its purchase and to make sure it gets out to the right people. The board also employs a manager who oversees this whole process on behalf of the board, manages the board's funds and liaises with the local boards. The board ensures that the fence is maintained in a dog proof condition and that wild dogs are actually destroyed in the vicinity of the fence. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. It also sets and collects the rates which get the money in so that we can actually run the fence. For at least the last decade, and probably a little bit before that, the board has worked with a budget of around $1.1 million per year. It's been maintained, real, realigned and upgraded since 1947. Now, funding the dog fence, <coughs> this is where it gets slightly complicated, but I'll do my best to talk you through it. Um, we receive funds from three different sources. The first one is the dog fence rate. And if you have a look at this map, um, you will see an area in grey which goes south of the fence, but more or less north of the, of the um, council areas in South Australia. Um, properties within this area that are greater than 
10 square kilometres, pay a dog fence rate of $1.33 per square kilometre on an annual basis, which comes straight to the dog fence. We send out invoices for that. Um, the second way of, get of getting funds is a portion of the levy paid by sheep producers when they sell sheep in South Australia um, goes to the um, sheep, the SA Sheep Industry Fund. And since 1999, the Sheep Industry Fund has contributed an amount of this money that would otherwise have been paid by the 2,870 land managers in the agri agricultural parts of South Australia whose properties are larger than 10 square kilometres. So it's really done on their behalf. Um, that brings in about $230,000 per annum. I should have said the, sheep, the um, rate brings in about $320,000 per annum. We also uh, charge a rate to properties outside the dog fence who utilise the fence as their southern boundary. And that brings in about $16,000 per annum. South Australian Treasury matches these funds once they're in on a dollar for dollar basis. So we get $550,000 roughly for, from outside sources and Treasury matches that giving us a total budget of $1.1 million. The, um, in total, the local dog fence boards and the private owner utilise about $400,000 of this fund to pay patrolmen to maintain the fence on a fortnightly basis. In fact, a private owner uh, out uh, in the northwest, they, they patrol, and patrol once a week rather than once a fortnight. Um, we set aside about $400,000 for um, rebuilding little parts of the fence that need, that need rebuilding. Um, we also put money aside into a contingency fund in case we get big fires like we did four years ago out on the west coast and floods mostly happening in the Flinders Ranges. Um, upgrading the dog fence in 2018-19 in cost about ten to $11,000 per kilometre. Um, and in some areas it can cost a lot more than that if you're going across floodplains or up over mountains like the Flinders Ranges. So we divvy out the money as best we can. We also pay salaries to two and a half public servants and maintain an office in Biosecurity SA which we get charged rent for, so um, everything's a, a, a pay-as-you-go system in the South Australian government. The current funding was, dis, uh, was decided back in 2017-18, in fact we've been thinking about this for a very, very long time. Um, no more funding was ever going to come out of the state government, it was felt. Um, and $1.1 million actually doesn't go very far. Um, we decided in 2018 that we would have to try and get more funding, larger amounts of funding from the federal government. The New South Wales fence, which is right next door to us, is the envy of everybody in South Australia because uh, they, have a very, they have only 584 kilometres to look after and a budget of about $9 million back in 2017. They also have um, a patrolman's house every 50 kilometres, and each patrolman only looks after 25 kilometres either side of his house. <laughs> so we were very envious of, of New South Wales' fence, and um, it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a trial, I think, trying to run our fence on such a very small budget. Anyway. Enough of that. A little bit now about the pressures the dog fence is under. It's amazing to some people to realise that two thirds of our dog fence is more than 100 years old. And it's ageing and it's brittle. 
and it can be damaged very easily. I mean, it makes a very effective bar barrier as long as things don't run into it, like kangaroos and emus, camels, wombats don't dig under it, and we don't get bad weather like floods and drifting sand. It's easier to look after a fence that's 100 years old if we don't have those things, but we do. I've got some pictures here of kangaroos mobbing up along the northern part of the fence. In West Australia they have emus and there's a lovely picture here down on the left hand side of emus mobbing along the fence in Western Australia. Um, we have wildfire, sorry, wildfires out on the west coast about four years ago. We had a big wildfire north of Sajuna, you may have remembered hearing about it on the news which took out, took out many kilometres of fence, which we had to immediately go and repair, like right then, it was a weekend when it happened, and we had men out on the fence. Standing it up again and putting in a new one where they had to, but many posts were, born, were burnt out, and um, it was quite trying for a while. We also have a lot of tourists who think that the dog fence board road, which runs on the northern side of the fence, is actually a public highway, which it isn't, it's actually a private road which is on pastoral property for most of, most of the time. Um, we have all sorts of warning signs up and uh, we do have quite a lot of um, problems with people leaving gates open and uh, yeah, it's, not, it's not, not an easy thing to do. However, <clears throat> one of the main pressures of course is dogs. Um, we do carry out extensive baiting of dogs with, um, usually we, we buy sh uh, kangaroo hearts from one of the big meat suppliers, um, Jews I think was one of them, and they're injected by um, our fence inspector, he's the only one in, the in that part of the department who's actually registered to do that. It's always been uh, a bit of a problem because We've always thought that the pastoralists should be able to get chemcert certificates to inject baits, but it's not been allowed by the government so far. So our fence inspector would go out and, and actually inject baits. We would buy already made baits, which is a thing called dog on. The baits are injected with 1080 poison, and over the last, uh, well, since 2012, you can see the graph at the top of the, of the um, picture on this side, um, up and we were spreading about 150,000 baits um, in 2012 and we're getting up towards spreading about 250,000 baits in 2018. Over the past 15 years wild dog numbers have significantly increased and they continue to invade the sheep zone in South Australia. Many of them were already south of the fence 15 years ago and they have bred up in good seasons. So it's not all coming through the fence. We also have a baited buffer zone extending 35 kilometres out from the northern fence, um, which was created in the mid 90s to provide additional insurance against incursion by wild dogs by reducing the density of the dogs in the vicinity of the fence. We have problems with camels out on the northwest section of the fence. You've probably heard about the two million camels in the interior of Australia. Um, we found that the very best way of, of deterring camels, they will run through a fence and if they've got some speed up, they'll take out you know, 200 metres of fence, no problem at all. Um, but for just the ones that are padding along the fence to see if we've got any gaps, we run a um, a solar powered electric wire along the top of the fence, which um, we run it on solar power and the batteries are kept in refrigerators and you'll see old refrigerators because they're useful. Um, you'll see on the top right hand slide there's a picture of the fridge with its uh, solar power panel and one of uh, the guys testing the wire and 6,000 volts going through that wire on the top of the fence actually does deter camels. They, they tend to not pad close to the fence. They'll go out into the next tire track over and pad in that one. You've seen that works, it keeps them off. 
it hits them in the brisket or on the wet nose and they leap back and, and we've actually seen this happen. So it's quite a good deterrent. Out on the west coast we have a big problem with wombats who dig under the fence, uh, they can dig huge holes seemingly overnight and provide an enormous trackway through under the fence for wild dogs. Again we've used um, solar powered electric wires for this purpose to keep them away at wombat nose height and it's extremely effective and in areas where it's really bad um, we have a wombat wire on both sides of the fence about that far out from the fence. And then we get droughts and drifting sand and flooding rains and lose all our fences that go across the creeks. This picture here um, is of one of our old uh, fence inspectors standing on top of a sand drift at the top left hand corner um, with his knees are about level with the top of the fence. Um, the picture on the right is of one of the creeks up in the northern Flinders ranges and we've come up with a very ingenious solution to save the fences that go across, the, across these creeks. Um, a wire is strung on a very strong pair of posts on either side of the creek. The fence is hung from the wire, it's not fixed at the bottom, and we have long pieces of poly pipe about that, that thick, which are sealed at either end and attached to the bottom of the fence. And when a big flood comes down, it actually the fence floats up and allows all of the, uh, the debris and the water to go underneath. And in most cases, they will stay firm. Some, sometimes when you get a really big flood with lots of big trees coming down, you have another chance. But uh, that does work extremely well. But we used to end up with all sorts of situations, like the bottom slide, where we'd go along and find fences wrapped around trees two kilometres downstream. So this, the strength in some of those flash floods is, is to be yeah, amazing. Yes. Repairs and maintenance are carried out on a continuous basis, even by the board that has gone out on its, uh, its um, trips. Most of these pictures were taken by myself with the board when we were fixing fences as we went. Is we try and leave most of it to the control room, but when you see a big gap, you have to fill it. The dog fence board <coughs> itself inspects half of the fence every year. Um, we do eastern half one year and western half the other. So, as I said, in the 12 years I've been on the board, I've been along that fence at least six times. Um, we camp out, uh, we take seven or eight days to do each trip and we camp out in swags, cook our own food and travel along the fence between 20 and 30 kilometres an hour mm -hmm. inspecting the fence. And those are just a few photos of us in camp. We do however see some wonderful things. I've just got a couple of slides here of fantastic years where we've seen grass growing all over the place, wonderful feed, beautiful wildflowers, including steps of desert pea all over the place. And we even found in one of our fridges where we had solar power, a little children's python curled up in the, fridge, in the freezer section. And here it is coming out of the fridge. We also see lots of wildlife, beautiful birds. This gecko fell out of a tree onto the windscreen. <laughs> this one here. We see kangaroos, we see beautiful sunsets, and it is a wonderful experience. We also look at the fence too. <laughs> um, we also have a few mishaps along the way. We've lost the whole axle off one of our trailers once and had to put all our swags inside the vehicles, which was quite squeezy. On good years, we have a lot of bogging as we go along, and um, that upsets the patrol because we wreck the roads. But, so we do get the greater out there from time to time. We also scrutinise the fence while we're out on, on the track. This is a lovely photograph here of the wide open spaces way out in the north of the state where the fence just goes on for miles and miles and miles. It seems to cross the horizon and you think the road's never going to end. 
Um, we decide at board level what, uh, what we're, our plans are for the following year and what bits of fence we can actually afford to, uh, to fix properly. We were very lucky in 2017 um, to get some extra money, which was sourced by Biosecurity SA. Um, we had $400,000 uh, from the federal government's um, Pest Animal and Weed Management in Drought Affected Areas Fund. And it enabled the board to upgrade 92 kilometres of fence along the northern section of the fence. Following year in 2018, we had $200,000 from the same source, which allowed us to upgrade 76 kilometres of fence um, along the northeastern side of the of the uh, fence um, around east of the Flinders Ranges. By the end of 2018, or towards the end, we realised that we would never ever go, unless we made a concerted effort to try and get money from somewhere, that the fence was never going to be able to withstand the pressures from the north, particularly in times of drought. It's, it's, uh, it just doesn't happen very well. So we decided that we would write an investment plan and present it to federal and state governments, which we did. Um, it took it took a few months to, to write this plan and we had to get um, all sorts of um, people to give us facts and figures and uh, write it in a style that we've been appealing to the state and federal governments. Um, we also had to get a cost benefit analysis done by an outside company so that it wasn't so seen that we were making things up. Eventually we put it together and we presented it to um, Tim Whetstone and David Littlebrow um, in probably, I think, November 2018. And uh, at the time we, we thought we don't stand a very good chance. It's just, you know, we've been asking for more money to deal with the dog fence for 15 years. It's not going to happen. Um, and we were amazed and delighted that both the federal and state governments took this on with a vengeance and Tim Whetstone must particularly thank him. He, he was the driving force behind helping us. He was terrific and he got even got Stephen Marshall on board and, and they declared uh, all sorts of things about this would be a wonderful thing but we can't do it on our own and we need federal government help and we need to get the livestock industry involved and, and, and everybody must do their bit. So. We had put together a fairly good case because it's a $4.3 billion livestock industry we're trying to protect. It also would provide social and economic benefits for pastoralists inside the fence. Um, for example, recent investments into wild dog exclusion fencing in Queensland are predict predicted to increase the gross margins of sheep pastoralists by up to 345%. In addition, the exclusion of fencing is predicted to generate substantial long-term benefits through increased employment and community investment. So we recommended that we get 25 million. What happens next? <laughs> I met quite a lot with um, people from Livestock SA and uh, they were terrific. Andrew Curtis and Jeff Power and, and many other people. We all sat down and talked and we talked with Tim Whetstone consistently. And the livestock industry came to the party first and said, well, we'll put in five million if you guys will put in $10 million each. And that's essentially what happened. Um, $25 million has been granted by the federal and state government and and uh, the livestock industry to, um, to upgrade 1,600 kilometres of 100 year old fence. So it was a pretty nice day when that happened. And it came around the same time as my term ended on the pastoral board, which is unfortunate, but um, I was really glad to hand over to Jeff Power, who has been 
instrumental in helping us get this money and also instrumental in many, many other facets of, of looking after the sheep industry in South Australia. Um, when I left the board, they, um, on our recommendation, they actually came up with a, a dog fence rebuild committee, which consists of the chair of the dog fence board, the chairs of the local dog fence boards, of which there are four of them, a representative of Livestock SA, the Northwest Fence Owner, that's the Jumbo Pastoral, um, and the PERSA Deputy Chief Executive. So it's been taken up to a fairly high level having the Deputy Chief Executive of PERSA on the Committee, the Rebuild Committee. It was decided and we recommended this uh, in our investment plan that the pastoralists themselves would essentially design the new dolphins. Um, we consulted widely with many, many people about how it would happen and um, we've set, we sent to the chairs of the local dog fence boards across to New South Wales and Queensland to see how they were doing it and what sort of fences they were using. And um, we also asked the pastoralists which, which sections we should start with, which, where, where the biggest problems were and also whether some sections might have to be realigned as well. Um, the first thing they did after, after I left was um, we also had at the, t at the same time a, a young woman from um, Persa who came on board as uh, being part of the, of the team to actually see how we could get it done. And she came up with the idea of actually using Google Earth and a, and a, tra a, a dash cam video. And uh, they took a video all the way from the head of Bight to the West Australia, uh, sorry, the New South Wales border. And uh, they clipped out a photo every two minutes along the entire length of the fence. And they used those photos extensively. And you can see here, there's um, a Google Earth image of South Australia with all of the little photos on it and outlining the, the fence. And beside that, uh, there is one of those photographs as an example of what we can pull off the video dash cam to, uh, to uh, have a record of where we're going to work first. They've used this as uh, an outline to schedule the rebuild. I understand uh, that uh, the fence builders and suppliers have been announced and they're actually on the website of the dog fence um, and uh, it's going to be a five year project to rebuild 1,600 kilometres of ageing fence. It's also expected to create quite a few jobs for remote community people and also for Aboriginal people along the way, so it's going to be quite good. And the rebuild is expected to um, help pastoralist industry groups, governments and other stakeholders to virtually eradicate wild dogs south of the fence within 10 years. Rebuilding the fence will have a considerable return on investment, generating net benefits to the state of up to $113 million over a 20 year period. Where to from here? And I was talking to the folks at Biosecurity SA and the dog fence just last week and they said that last week work had actually begun on starting to do this on the northeastern section of the fence. They've uh, started the first 23 kilometres to follow, immediately followed by a new section of 115 kilometres right after they finished the 23. So it is starting to happen. They're hoping to have most of it done in a couple of, in five years. And we will have an almost brand new fence, which will be absolutely wonderful. Um, you can find more information at the, um, at the Dog Fence website. It's actually part of the Primary Industries and Regions website. I've put the link at the bottom of the page on this final slide but I don't know if you can actually click on it to get more information. But they have assured me that uh, they will, any time there's some new news about the dog fence or bits that have been completed or um, new people involved, that they will be 
actually putting all of this up on the dog fence website, so there'll be plenty of information coming out in the future. If you need any more information, please don't hesitate to give me a call. Um, I'm sure that um, the people at the Royal Geographical Society of South Australia will have my contact details and I'd be happy to talk to anyone. Thank you very much. It's been lovely to talk to you all. I'm so pleased to be able to tell the story of the dog fence. It's very precious. Carol, that was a fascinating lecture. It is just an extraordinary thing, the dog fence. And uh, um, I wonder really how many people in this state have any idea about it at all. I don't think many people do, to be honest. It's always been um, a part of... I mean, everybody might know about the dog fence, but as for where it goes and what it does and how it's maintained, and the most extraordinary country that it goes through, and the extraordinary people who live along it. I don't think anybody has any idea about those sorts of things. And no doubt that's really part of the, the funding dilemma for so many years up until mm -hmm. this recent breakthrough that you talked about. I think that's the case. It's, um, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. So like so many things that are away from the city, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's very close to my heart. It's, uh, I think that people who live in, in the regions of South Australia do miss out on a lot of, on a lot of good things that we take for granted in the city. Um, I think that uh, we've, got, we've had successive governments who have not been even slightly interested in putting money into the dog fence in spite of all the good things that can come out of it. And it is one of the major industries of South Australia, the livestock industry, and I believe that it's it's well worth supporting, and it's $25 million. In, in, when you think of how much money has been spent recently on all sorts of other things, $25 million isn't very much at all. And when you contrast that too with the actual value of the, the livestock industry, right. yes. it really is it, it's kind of a drop in the ocean. It is. It? That's, yes. I, 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 I really think that so many people don't appreciate just how destructive these dogs are, how yeah. Really, how cool they are too. I mean, well, the way they do what they do. I think it's it's um, it's heartbreaking. But I've I've listened many many times to people from the country talking about what dogs have done to their flocks, yes. and seeing many many pictures and videos of the destruction, and seeing the, the actual physical evidence myself. And it's heartbreaking. It really is. And people get the idea that they're really cute and they're, you know, they're dogs, they're like man's best friend. But so many of them in Australia are so interbred with wild dogs that have actually been let go by careless owners. Um, and there are very few pure diggers left in Australia. So it's, it's, they really are a pest. It's, and as you said, they, yeah. they, they are an unprotected species. They're not yes. recognised as a native Australian yeah. animal under the law, are they? they well, they, that depends on who you talk to. They're, and what state you're in, I guess, too. State, <laughs> but it also, the, the, I believe it's the EPBC Act, and I don't quote me on this, that says that any, any animal that was here more than 1,400 years ago is a native animal. Now, that's only under the one federal act, but I think that's what it is. I'm not quite sure my source is there, so don't quote me. Um, but there's been a lot of, um, of uh, papers being published in the last 10 years about the video status in Australia, whether it is actually a native animal or, a, or, a, or an import like rabbits or camels. Um, and it's a very divided uh, narrative. Many people who think, yes, they're a native animal, they were precious also to Aboriginal people in South Australia too, or in Australia. Um, and it's a very um, murky area, to be honest, and it's, it's, it's a matter for a huge debate. So, you know, you have to be fairly careful what you say. To yeah, it's, it is a difficult balancing act. But mm. if you go north, there's no doubt about what people think about, oh, exactly. about well, these well, things. I, I realise that, that you, when you're trying to, to we found this when we're writing our investment report, that's, um, or investment plan, sorry, 
that um, we had to be fairly careful with the wording of it. That we, we weren't too over the top, but we had to be over the top enough to, to be able to attract people's attention. Yeah. So, you know, you have to be very careful these days about what you like. Very. Now, interestingly, the dog fence, the root of the dog fence has actually changed over time as well. Can you tell us a little bit about not, that? Not hugely. It has in Queensland. Mm. Um, they've cut off an enormous tongue of land in Queensland, north of the north of the, of the fence as it stands now. I believe because the Queensland government fed up with, with actually paying out to maintain it. Um, and um, those people are the people nowadays who are building cluster fences outside the yes, dog fence. They've taken it into their own they've hands. They've taken it into their own hands to actually protect groups of properties um, with pretty bulletproof fencing. I mean, it's enormously expensive to build cluster fencing, hugely expensive. Um, but they think it's worth it to, uh, to actually maintain their sheep flocks outside the dog fence. Um, and protect them off their own bat. And how do New South Wales do it so well? They've got the Rolls Royce version well, of the fence. They have a lot more money. <laughs> and almost it's a simple all, of their, all of their patrolmen are, um, are salaried employees under the government, the state right? government, and, um, and all of their money comes from the government. They go, they, New South Wales government as well. It's, it's got a bigger population to start. Um, and it comes. Um, I presume they must have a better lobby in Parliament. I'm not quite sure how it works, but with only a million people or a million and a bit people in South Australia, what is it? How many in New South Wales? Quite a few more. Five or six more. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. um, it's quite uh, quite a different story. Funding basis. Funding basis. And they don't have like, as much fence as we have. We no. have 2,150 kilometres. They've got a quarter of that. Yes. So, so it's simple yeah. mathematics really, I guess, at the end of the day. Isn't and it, it is a beautifully maintained fence. And they're lovely, lovely guys who run it. And I've been up there and mm -hmm. I've, I've met with their, they call it the Wild Dog Destruction Board in, in New South Wales, not the Dog Fence Board. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've um, been out with pastoralists at different points over the years yeah. and, um, and in places like, particularly Flinders, seen original sections of the dog fence, yes, re yes. remnant sections remnant. that have been replaced and, and when you look at them, when that's pointed out to you, I, I found it quite startling because it, the, those original fences weren't quite how I imagined that they would be. You know, I thought they'd be big high fences but they're not at all. Now what, why is that? Because the, the generally accepted way is that um, Dogs actually don't jump over fences unless they're absolutely desperate. Um, what are the wild dogs? Dingoes. So we've had, we have a policy that the, the fence is um, five feet tall. It's much cheaper to build a five foot fence than it is to build a seven foot fence. I bet. Um, and we haven't seen too much credible evidence that dogs actually do jump over five foot fences. That's fascinating. Yeah. But as you said in your presentation... But a lot of those, a lot of, sorry, the, the fences you're talking about, you may have been seeing old vermin-proof fences, which were originally put up mm. for rabbits. Yes. And rabbits can't go high fence. Uh, even if you've got a fence like this, the rabbits won't go over so, uh, yeah, it. Oh. It's, it's, it's quite fascinating. I, um, I yeah. was re really surprised by it. But, but so the, the, the standard fence now is five feet high. That's what we, we've said, because it's, I mean, I think they're going to, they may be going to build a new fence that's higher than that. Okay. I, I don't know. I haven't been part mm. of the, the decision-making process. Mm. Um, but five, at the time, five feet tall the fences was all we could afford. Mm. Can you make a fence that camels can't go through? Because I know no, just how significant no. an issue that has been out on the far west. No, I don't think it can. It's, uh, you can, you can... When a camel's on a mission, that's it. When a camel's on a mission, I mean, it's try, like trying to stop a bus, I suppose, isn't it? Mm. It's, uh, it's, um, they're big animals when you see them on the I'll tell you. Absolutely enormous. Yeah. And of course, they're, they're so very well fed in Australia, you know, that they don't suffer from any diseases or parasites, and, and, and they have all this land out there to eat it or eat from them. They're far better, in far better condition than any camels are from them. Yes, and I believe they're quite attractive for the um, people Absolutely. in the Middle East to yes. buy too, because of because of the genetics and all of those things. But going back to uh, 
um, the fence itself. $25 million, um, all of this massive rebuilding in yeah. this state over what five years or so. Yeah. What will that give us in future, Carolyn, and how much easier will it be for the Dog Fence Board for some years to come? For the future, it will give us a fence that's much easier to take care of, um, one that's going to be under a lot less pressure from... from um, I, the fence materials nowadays are so much better than they were 100 years ago. Yes. Um, although the ones that have lasted for 100 years have been there for 100 years. So, True. <laughs> so they have done their job. Um, it's going to make patrolling the fence a lot easier. It's going to make... Um, Oh, it's going to keep the dogs out for a start. That'll be good. Yes. Um, and hopefully, it's it, it will it will be able to protect the sheep. So in the fence, you can't really ask for very much more than that. Can you? No, you cannot. And and this is this is a really random question because I, I think I, when I asked the first one about people's awareness of yes. the fence or not and. Yeah. Largely, I think it's not. Yes. Um, just had this random thought while we were talking that you know maybe there's potential for some tourism along that fence mm. because it goes through some remarkable country. Would, would that be something that it's, you'd entertain? Or would it just be I too difficult? It, I think it's it's difficult, um, and it's, it would involve an enormous num number of different people to to make that happen. Um, it is. And it is private land, land. It is, so it is called land. Yes. Um, they, they are um, tracks that the pastoralists use. Um, it's not something that. Um, no, it's just a random thought, really, because it would certainly raise awareness about oh, the so fence and so where it goes. Would, um, and, um, people what it have, does. Have, um, have asked us that many times before. It's not, it's not a new okay. concept, okay? It's not some, something <laughs> that's, that's very fresh. But and we've always said no because it's it is complicated. So we don't have the people to supervise that sort of thing. Um, they may change their minds in the future. Who knows? But uh, yes. it's something that uh, you'd have to get pastoralists on the side. The fence is on the, in, the, in the cattle country to the north. It's not south of the. Yes. There is no there is no road south of the fence. It's all on mm. the northern side of the fence. So you'd have to get all the pastoralists involved. And, um, and you'd have to change some of the wording of the act and all of those sorts of things. So yes. it wouldn't be something that would be simple. No. I don't know. But well, that would depend true. entirely on the board and the pastoralists and the government, essentially. Just look out and just ran your body. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you won't get any further than that. And just finally, Carolyn, yes. you, you've spent um, a significant proportion yes. of your life associated with the dog fence. Yes. What does that mean to you personally, and, and also given your um, background too and your interests? It's, it's um, I've, I've thought it was a huge privilege to be involved with the Dolphins Board, um, as I did when I was on the Pastoral Board and the Natural Resource Management Board, because it's meant that I can give something back to... I had the wonderful opportunity to study at the Adelaide University and do my PhD, and, and work and live in the outback for most of my working life. And I've always thought it's been, it's been so, such a privilege. I've seen so many places and I've spoken to so many people and yes. been warmly received on at people's properties and um, uh, the scenery out there and, and the whole thing. I mean, if, if, if I was married say, to uh, someone the here in town, I would live out there. Yes. <laughs> So, um, yes, I have seen lots more of South Australia, and I wasn't even born here. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carolyn Island, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you as one of our uh, lecturers in 2020. It's a shame we couldn't do it in front of our, yeah. uh, our normal live audience, yes. but this literally is the next best thing, and I yes. know that our members will really appreciate it. So, on behalf of the World Geographical Society of South Australia, this is just a token of our appreciation much. for a fascinating Thank lecture. Very much and uh, we really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.